Hi, I'm Dr. Neil Barnard. I'm an adjunct associate professor of medicine at the George Washington University and president of the Physicians Committee. And we have wonderful teaching materials on medical issues that are related to nutrition. And our idea is to be able to supplement all the great information that's already being transmitted in medical schools with a special emphasis on nutrition. We have beautiful slides for you, and I'm going to walk you through some right now. We're going to talk now about our diabetes program. We have several others that you want to look at. We have certain learning objectives for every one of our programs, and the learning objectives are spelled out so that the students and the faculty members know exactly what we're going to do. And when we get to the slides themselves, we have a special feature. You can look underneath each slide at the notes section and you will actually see everything that you need to know and everything that the professor needs to deliver in the course of the lecture. So let's get started. I want to show you how this one works. The epidemiology of diabetes is frightening. One in every three Americans now has either diabetes or pre-diabetes. Well, what's going on? Inside the middle of the body, right behind your belly button, is the pancreas. The pancreas makes insulin. And insulin's job is to help glucose to get into the cells. So the insulin is made in the pancreas, it goes into the bloodstream, and it arrives at the cell and helps glucose get inside. Now type 1 diabetes, you remember what that is? That's where the pancreas is no longer making insulin. In type 2, the pancreas is still making uh, insulin, but the cells are resistant to it. The pancreas tries to make more, but it can't keep up. Gestational diabetes, when does that occur? During pregnancy, that's right. And it's very much like type 2. It's the shot across the bow that type 2 is around the corner if we're not careful. Now let's zero in on a cell and see how this works. Outside this cell, this is a muscle cell, the glucose needs to get inside to fuel that cell. And the insulin hormone has arrived at the surface of the cell, attaches to the receptors there like a key and a lock, and it is going to signal little channels to allow the glucose to come into the cell. The problem in diabetes, and this is important, inside the cell are tiny fat droplets that are building up. Now, doctors hate words like fat. It has only three letters. So we'll call it intramyocellular lipid. It's fat inside muscle cells. Researchers at Yale University, through MR spectroscopy, showed that the buildup of intramyocellular lipid contributes to resistance to insulin and could be the first factor leading toward diabetes. Well, what's the evidence about diet and diabetes? Let's take a lesson from Japan. You hear people saying, okay, to avoid diabetes, I should avoid starches like potatoes or bread or rice. In Japan, they eat huge amounts of rice day after day after day. And in adults over the age of 40, prior to 1980, diabetes was rare, 1 to 5% of the population. Well, what happened around that time? Western diets came in and we started seeing burgers and chicken nuggets and pizza and cheese and the fat content of the diet went up. The carbohydrate content of the Japanese diet started to fall. That meant they were eating less rice, less carbs, more fatty Western foods. And for women, the body mass index, the body weight, didn't change so much really for cultural reasons. It was the men who were eating out at fast foods and, and uh, having Western business lunches and they started to gain weight first and what we saw is by 1990 diabetes was 11 to 12 percent of the population. So that shows us that it's not all genetics, that there's a huge role for diet changes. Let's take a lesson from the United States. In the United States we have had a meat-based diet and it reached an all-time high in 2004. Luckily meat consumption has been dropping a little bit since that time. The big increase by the way, anybody know? It was not beef, it was chicken. Americans now eat about a million chickens per hour, thinking that that's healthy food. And that's led to a number of changes in the diet. Let me say a special word about cheese. Cheese intake has gone up dramatically as fast food chains, and especially pizza chains, have become more and more popular. And the average American now consumes well over 30 pounds of cheese every single year. That adds up, by the way, if you're counting, it adds up to almost 60,000 calories of cheese every year.
But what about sugar? Not health food, but sugar has actually been dropping. If you look at all sweeteners together, it rose up until about 1999, at which point bottled water started to take a bigger part of the market, and sodas, sugared sodas particularly, were edged out. So we're seeing a drop in soda and a drop in sweeteners overall. Uh, however, even though that's not health food, I point out the drop in, in sugar to make it clear that there are other things going on. And this sort of westernization in Japan, the meat and cheese in the United States, those are big contributors. Take a look at the U.S. map. Up at the top, you see the states where diabetes was less than 4% in the overall adult population. And across the bottom, do you see Louisiana and Mississippi there? More than 6%? Well, this was 1994. And as the diet has changed in 95 and 96 and 97 and 98, as the years went by, diabetes came roaring in. And then if we change the color pattern starting in 2006, zeroing in on specific counties, the map is continuing to get worse. All right, so what can we do about it? Diet is really the key but what kind of diet has been something that researchers have really been looking into. Historically, a conventional diabetes diet has zeroed in on two things. Making sure that my carbohydrate intake stayed pretty steady throughout the day. And that was partly because it was hard to set a medication dose if a person is eating more carbohydrate one day and less the next day. In other words, if you're injecting the same amount of insulin every day and one day you don't eat any carbohydrate, your blood sugar could fall too low because of the insulin effect. The next day, if you had a lot of carbohydrate, it might not be enough insulin. So carbohydrate counting became a way to help people to really manage their medication. And then cutting out calories, a calorie deficit, was a traditional way of helping people to lose weight. You normally eat 2,000 calories a day, let's eat only 1,500. For many patients, that gets old by about Wednesday because they're hungry, but that's still uh, a very, very common approach. Well, there are other approaches that have been studied. Some not so good, some very good. Let's just go through them quickly. One way that you'll hear about a lot has been quite a fad, the low carbohydrate diet. It's been popularized by Atkins and South Beach and a number of others. And the idea is that you avoid the starchy foods, the grains and the sugars and the starchy vegetables and so forth. And what that leaves is the higher protein and also higher fat foods. The rationale is if there's no carbohydrate and no sugar in your body, your blood sugar has got to fall. And that's true. Um, however, there are some disadvantages of this approach. What you see is that overall, low carbohydrate diets are associated with higher mortality. And there is, because because the diet is high in cholesterol and fat, without those healthy starches there, then you end up with higher cardiovascular risk. And what will this do if you actually did this for 20 or 25 years? Who knows? Now, there are lower fat diets. They haven't really been studied very much, but the idea is you take an omnivorous diet and reduce fatty foods. Overall, that's a move in the right direction, but we really need to have more research to see how far you can get with just that approach alone. Then Mediterranean diets have been popular, in part because everyone would rather be in a Mediterranean country than where they are now. But the diet does have some healthy characteristics. It's typically lower in meat, and the saturated fats tend to be replaced by the unsaturated fats, particularly something uh, like olive oil. Wine is consumed in some of these areas by some people, sometimes not. But the, the pattern that you see now is commonly referred to as a Mediterranean diet. And when it's put to the test, you do see evidence of some benefit, both cardiovascular benefits and you also see benefits from the standpoint of diabetes. Studies do show that when people follow a Mediterranean diet, their hemoglobin A1C improves. That's the indication of blood sugar control that reflects your blood sugar control over about a three month period. And their body mass index, their body weight essentially, improves as well. So let's do a little quiz. Take a look at these uh, points of the diet. How does a Mediterranean diet incorporate these? Have a look at each one. And now I'm going to show you the answers. Have a look. How did you do? Fair enough. All right, let's go on. The DASH diet. 
the dietary approaches to stop hypertension. As its name implies, it uh, was originally formulated to lower blood pressure. It was actually inspired by the observation that vegetarians tend to have a little bit lower blood pressure, so it was a modified semi-vegetarian diet that reduced meats and increased vegetables and fruits and some other very healthful changes overall. The Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension Diet, the DASH diet. It was actually inspired by an observation that vegetarians tend to have lower blood pressure. So the question was, if I use sort of a semi-vegetarian diet, would that lower blood pressure too? And it does. And it has been modified now in various ways uh, to tackle diabetes. And it does have a number of healthy features. And when you look at the rationale for the DASH diet, it makes sense. You're getting away from the unhealthy fats. You're including a lot of healthy things like vegetables, fruits, more whole grains. And in clinical trials, it actually does show some benefit. That's good. Uh, what you do see is improvements in body weight. And you also see improvements in blood sugar control as manifested by hemoglobin A1C. Now, let's take a little quiz. If you had a patient who came in and you wanted to recommend the DASH diet, how would you do it? What words would you use? Why don't you turn to your neighbor right now and give them one sentence about the DASH diet. Okay, and this would be an exercise that we could do in any classroom setting. All right, now let's look at plant-based diets. They have been studied to a great degree recently and that's partly due because in epidemiological studies, Diets that have little or no animal products and are built almost entirely or entirely from plant foods, they're associated with many, many health benefits. Now, plant-based diets, they vary. You'll see diets that are called lacto-ovo. They've got milk and eggs. A vegan diet, a vegan is not a person from the planet Vegas, simply means a diet with no animal products at all. And one of the big bodies of evidence for it comes from Seventh-day Adventists. They have been studied because church teachings say that one should be a non-smoker, avoid alcohol, avoid caffeine, and although church teachings say to avoid meat, some people follow it and some don't, which sets up a natural experiment of non-smoking health-conscious people who vary in diet, and so the diet patterns can be tested. And what you see is quite interesting. In a study of about 61,000 Adventists looking at body mass index, that's the part on the left side here, uh, what you see is that the people following a typical non-vegetarian meat-based diet had a BMI 28.8, so that's, we want to be under 25, so the average meat eater was a little bit overweight as Americans are. But as you go stepwise to a semi-vegetarian, Pesco vegetarian, what's that? It's fish, right? Uh, to a lacto-ovo vegetarian, and finally to vegan, you see the body mass index falling toward a healthier level, finally in the vegans. But the diabetes part of this graph follows the same kind of change, only a bit more dramatic. Diabetes is very common in meat eaters, rare in vegans. Now, you might be saying, wait a minute, those vegans are probably better educated, they might exercise more. True enough, but even when we control for those things, you still, still see quite a benefit for the plant-based diet. A study in Washington, D.C. brought in people with type 2 diabetes and did a head-to-head -head comparison of a conventional diabetes diet, focusing on carbohydrate limiting and reducing calories. And the conventional diet was compared with a vegan diet, plant-based diet. And what we saw was comparing the changes in hemoglobin A1C of the two groups. And for now, I'm going to limit the results to those people who made no changes in medications at all that would confuse the data. You see quite a difference. The red line is the conventional diet group. They did well. They had a drop in their A1C of about 0.4. But the vegan group had a drop of about 1.2 absolute percentage points, which is terrific. Now, when we look over the long run, you do see some regression in the benefit, but uh, you, do, you continue to see a difference with an advantage for the people in the plant-based group. When we look at weight changes, both groups lost weight with a slight advantage for the people on the plant-based diet. But what's remarkable about that is that they weren't actually trying to lose weight. In other words, they weren't 
cutting calories, reducing portion sizes, while the group on the conventional diet was trying to do that. So uh, this suggests some real advantages to a plant-based diet. You don't have to count calories. You don't have to limit carbohydrates, particularly in a, in a typical case, and you still lose weight and your A1C still improves uh, for most people. Now LDL, low density lipoprotein, that improved as well. Why? You're not eating animal fat. You're not eating cholesterol. Um, a separate study looked at weight control for people who did not have diabetes, and what you saw is very much the same sort of thing. Uh, even without specific calorie counting, people on plant-based diets lose weight. The insurance company, Geico, uh, hosted a study that was very similar, uh, using the same kind of diet change, but in 10 different cities around the country, and the results were quite dramatic. People lost weight using a plant-based diet at work, and those people who happened to have diabetes had an improvement in their hemoglobin A1C as well, suggesting that it's not just good in a laboratory setting, but it's good in real life too. So why a plant-based diet? Well, compared with other kinds of diets and conventional rec uh, recommendations, it seems to have real advantages. And over the long run, it reduces the risk for heart disease and cancer and obesity. And it increases fiber intake, which helps with weight loss and brings in other uh, benefits as well. Now, when you're talking with patients, the first question the patient is going to have is, what do I eat now? Well, the beauty of this is there are many changes that you can walk the patient through. And in this lecture format, we can talk about how to replace each thing. It's very simple. Instead of cow's milk, we might have soy milk. And you walk through one dish at a time, and you'll really empower the patient. The patient is also going to say, OK, doc, but where do I get my protein? And what you can reassure them is that they don't need the animal protein. Plant foods have plenty of protein. One very important point that you do want to make sure that you convey to your patients is vitamin B12. Not made by animals or plants. Vitamin B12 is made by bacteria. And the idea is that the bacteria in a cow's gut make a certain amount of vitamin B12 that gets into the meat. Um, the human gut has bacteria in it that make B12 as well, but our absorption appears to be very poor because the, those bacteria are too low down. Whatever the case, it's important for your patients to take a B12 supplement that's critical for anybody on a vegan diet. And it's good advice for everybody because after the age of maybe 50, patients aren't making a lot of stomach acid, which you need to pull B12 off of uh, foods. Uh, also, if they're on, met on metformin or acid-blocking drugs, their absorption of B12 is not very good. So the amount you need is very small, 2.4 micrograms. And we encourage everybody over the age of 50, everybody on a vegan diet to do it. And frankly, there's no reason not to do it at any age. OK, let's talk about putting nutrition into practice. What would you say? OK, read this with me. Your patient's fasting blood glucose is 140. Is that good? I don't think so. That's too high. And his hemoglobin A1C is 8.0. Is that good? Nope. Uh, he asks, what diet could give him the best chance at a healthy life? What would you say? All right, think it through. This is going to be a real question for you with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people that you're going to see very soon. Take this information, put it to work. Thanks a lot.